Hello, hello. Good afternoon. A very warm welcome to the British Council. Hello. My name's Bob, Bob Ness. I'm the director of this organization here, and I've had the good fortune to live in your wonderful, exciting city for the last three and a half years. So um, we're really uh, very pleased to be able to host this event. Um, it's been a, a huge and interesting event and journey for us. It's been a learning experience for me personally, and I've got my piece of paper and my pen, and I'm going to be listening extremely carefully and learning from you guys about the whole discussion about public art in the city. Um, that's all I'm going to say about public art in the city, because you're the experts. But I have the uh, daunting task ahead of me on the 17th of May at the Fringe Club, and you'll be very, very welcome to join us. We'll give you some information later. I'll be moderating a discussion about public art, so I better learn something now, so I can go along on the 17th of May and do that uh, without embarrassing myself. But I, I, what I do realize is how much, well, I'm an outsider, so I have to be careful of what I assume about Hong Kong, but what it seems to me is that Event Horizon has provoked uh, a lot of very, very interesting discussion uh, around the whole issue of art, public art, access, what it brings to a city, etc., etc. But I keep saying they're the experts, so I won't uh, say any more except to welcome you. Do you mind if I would just pass the microphone for one minute to my colleague Sue? She's one of our teachers, and she's very involved in the project, and she wants to just tell you something very quickly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Um, I'd just like to encourage everyone to come to our final Event Horizon workshop for teachers on Thursday the 27th. Um, it's there on the Event Horizon website. And what we do is we're looking at ways we can encourage our students to get more involved with sculpture. And we do do quite a bit of work encouraging them to um, participate more in going and finding public artwork in Hong Kong, because you have some fantastic stuff. So please remember, next Thursday, 5 to 7, um, it's our very last event, Horizon Workshop. Thank you. Hope to see some of you there. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bob. Um, Hi, everybody. I'm Susanna. I'm from Asia Art Archive, and I welcome everyone in attending today's activities. This is organized by our teaching program of AAA. First, this activity is a teaching lab. It's an annual event, a series of annual events for teachers to pioneer some training activities and initiatives. We're very glad to be part of British Council's the working partner of this project. Today's activity will mainly involve, will be conducted in Cantonese. There will be four speakers. The first speaker will use English, but we assume everyone will understand English to a certain extent. Also, we have some outlines available for everyone. Also, the host will have some summary and conclusions for the whole process. There will be simultaneous interpretation from Chinese to English. If there are any problems during the process, if there's something wrong with the receiver, please raise your hand. Somebody will provide assistance. So, um, I know that uh, so the program today will be uh, conducted in Cantonese, in, uh, but uh, among four, four of the speakers, one of them will speak in English, the other three will speak in Cantonese. But we will have simultaneous translation all through the program. So, if your uh, SI uh, machine uh, have any problem during the program, please raise up your hand so our colleagues will come to have you to change to another one. So, you just, you just have to come up. So, without further ado, I will introduce her quickly about um, Asia Art Archive. So, because not everyone will know about AAA, we have three directions. 
we specialize in collecting contemporary art information, both online and offline physical information. We have a library in Shenhuang and a website available for educators and everyone to search for Asia contemporary art resources. Another emphasis is to establish the community of different interests, including groups for youth and educators, because we believe that persistent and, and going interactions is very conductive. So there are a lot of educators today. They will play a number of roles here, a number of teachers. They will be commentators or elicit discussions. So I hope everyone will continue co participating. This has been the 16th year of AAA. Aside from educational initiatives, we conduct a number of talks and digitization of information, research, including art practitioners and artists' residency programs. So we come everyone to participate in a activities. So for today's teaching lab, each year around March to July, we have a number of topics and wish to involve educators on exploring the role of contemporary art in education and apply them in the classrooms. And for today, aside from classroom learning, today's topic is about public art and urban space. For this year, we emphasize alternative learning pla platform because for contemporary artists, it's not constrained just in a workshop. It's th the whole city is their campuses. We believe that arts education should not be restricted just within the classroom. And for today, our first session is about urban space, public art. And for next month, in May 7th, we have another teacher on another topic about street art. And we encourage all the educators to participate as well. And for today's talk, I will first introduce the four speakers and I'll hand the time over to them later on. First, our host moderator today is um, Mr. Lao Tin Mei. He's the vice principal of HKICC School of Creativity in Hong Kong. And the second speaker is Mr. Samson Wong. He's an independent curator. And uh, Ms. Anthony Lampochen is an artist and an art critic. And, and Ingrid Chu from AAA. is the curator of AAA public activities. So we will invite Mr. Lao Timing now, who is our host today and speaker. Okay. We'll enter into the four parts of today's workshop. We kind of divided our work today. Ingrid will, will introduce Anthony Gormley's works, his characteristics, and the special topics that we elicit from his works. And Lenpo Shan will talk more about Anthony Gormley as an artist and considerations on arts in the city. And Samson will talk more about urbanism, the space in the city, the imagination from the art. And for myself, the last part will elicit discussions. So it will be around 45 to 60 minutes during discussion. We hope for more participation from every one of you. Thank you. So now we'll have Ingrid first. So while we're getting the uh, PowerPoint set up, can everyone hear me okay? Great, thank you. Um, so as uh, my colleague Susanna said, I'm the public programs curator at uh, Asia Art Archive, and I'm uh, really excited to be uh, speaking a little bit more and introducing the work of uh, Anthony Gormley. And then I'll touch upon a little bit of uh, Event Horizon. And then that will be followed by putting him in uh, his work in context with a larger uh, perspective of uh, public art internationally. And we'll touch a little bit also on some um, 
famous or infamous uh, controversies related to public art. And uh, finally, uh, we'll also um, sort of uh, touch on some points that will um, sort of really just kind of, as a by way of introduction, not really get into too much of um, some of these topics, but really as a way so that uh, they will be then enriched through the discussion and the uh, subsequent presentations. So uh, with that, um, hence the primer, we'll start with the introduction on uh, Anthony Gormley. First, I wanted to uh, read this quote to you. I thought since we were talking about public art, and this notion of a sort of collective idea of what it might mean that the definition should come from a publicly accessible place. So, care of Wikipedia, this is the definition of public art. Public art is art in any media that has been planned and executed with the intention of being staged in the physical public domain, usually outside and accessible to all. With that sort of frame in mind, we'll think about Anthony Gormley, or Sir Anthony Gormley, a, a British sculptor who, um, if you even look on his own website, really dispenses with any biography or description of himself. Um, and in that way, he's really speaking, I think, trying to speak through his work. But in looking at his work, he has a long, long history of working from the late 80s, uh, obviously continuing until today. And there are many historic references. I mean, we, I wanted to just sort of really touch upon some uh, references over time from paintings like Caspar David Friedrich to some more recent uh, projects by Francis Alice of uh, Faith Can... Uh, there's a sort of a list of works you can uh, follow along. When Faith Moves Mountains in Lima, Peru. Uh, Stephen Balkanal, who also had this sort of floating figure um, on the water. And uh, Pablo Elguera, who did a cross-country trip from Anchorage, Alaska to South America for a project in uh, 2003 called the School of Pan-American Unrest. So really, um, and I don't have an image of it here, but um, as I was saying to our, um, my fellow speakers today, you know, figures um, on top of buildings have been around since the Greek statues, um, you know, and things like, and many buildings, famous buildings that we see today. So I sort of wanted to create a little bit of a larger framework um, through which, a lens through which we can maybe look and think a little bit more about um, Anthony Gormley's uh, Event Horizon project. So here, with that in mind, next slide, um, here are uh, just a, a range of projects. Um, he does many other types of projects, but I wanted to kind of keep in mind the idea of uh, body in space, and, um, or as I, we call it uh, here in this talk, site and situation. And those can be many different contexts. So this is uh, his project, Angel of the North. It's, 700 tons of steel and concrete. It's a very, very large, and it is in the northeast of England, and it is sort of a bordering on this uh, idea of industry and the technology and where human beings are between those two places. And you can tell by the scale, it's very, very large on the hillside. Next slide. Uh, and then this is a series called Horizon Field, which were 100 uh, solid cast iron pieces. Um, and those were, if you want to switch to the next slide, same project. Next slide. Um, sorry, uh, go back one. Yeah. So you can kind of tell just by that that um, these um, figures kind of have, are in snow, are in you know the landscape, they're in various places. So they really, really are... Um, Again, this uh, notion of a, being across time and space. And uh, looking a little bit more closely, this is similar to what uh, we have in Hong Kong, where it's, it's his body that he has cast, whereas the uh, one before was this kind of more abstract, large, sort of almost winged, um, uh, I guess, persona, not even really based on a human uh, being for the uh, Angel of the North. And so the next one is another example called Horizon, uh, sorry, called Domain Field. And you can see that he also does works in interiors, uh, museums, um, he's often commissioned for those uh, types of uh, projects. Um, and this one is, he sort of calls a collective energy field. But in this one you can kind of see that they're, these all, they're all made out of like little metal bits um, 
uh, put together. And this was done at a museum in, again, in England at the Baltic. But in this case, um, it's important to note that he actually um, used people in the local area and cast their bodies. So really, it's not only a collective energy field, it's actually a kind of a, um, a collective portrait. And then this last one I thought is like, oh, real people. <laughs> um, or at least this idea of um, creating a space for which um, the human, you know, the human beings he, he sort of uh, tries to uh, show through his uh, sort of um, metal works are actually gathered together through this project called uh, Horizon Field Hamburg in uh, 2012. And so, so these uh, projects range from 1998 to 2012. And this was a, you can kind of see on the, right top right side, there's stairs. So it's actually literally an elevated field in this really large building, um, sort of very mirrored, pl uh, mirrored surface where people could walk up and gather together, see themselves because of the surface material. And so then again, it, go, it becomes a, a, a field of self-reflection, a field of then sort of being conscious of um, not only yourself, but uh, of the other people um, are surrounding, your, uh, surrounding the space. So just to show you a kind of a range of his uh, prior practice. So, next slide. so if you want to move to um, this particular project here in Hong Kong, Event Horizon Hong Kong. And before I go further, um, I just wanted to share with you that uh, I won't really share many images of what you see in Hong Kong because you should just go out and see it. <laughs> That's why it's here. And, but rather I wanted to sort of use it as a way to look at uh, some recent projects in uh, Hong Kong and um, at some of Gorm including some of Gormley's own in Asia. Next slide. We all know this one. <laughs> um, this is a rubber duck project. This was a by Felix Gonzalez Torres, which was a billboard project that was here last year. This is the King of Kowloon. And this is uh, Frog King, who uh, coincidentally is part of our collection. And this is um, what's often noted as one of the earliest performances in, in Beijing. So it's sort of looking at um, anything, really the range from um, public art projects that are popular, um, artists that are well known for um, doing um, uh, public art projects to um, types from billboards to performances and then um, I think we'll get to a little later um, what are the formats and even though you're in public are they really public and so I think they raise uh, some questions like that and then who gets to say uh, when public art is public you know and, the, and what it is and um, who it belongs to. So these are a few things that I think these sort of range of projects show. This is Anthony Gormley. Before he did Event Horizon in Hong Kong, he did this project called Asian Field in Guangzhou, and it traveled to um, a number of locations uh, in Beijing, Shanghai, and Chongquang. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And this was uh, done quite early in 2003, and I believe it actually now belongs to the collection of M+. Plus, so you'll probably be able to see it again in Hong Kong. But as you can tell, um, again, to show uh, the range of his work, look how tiny these little uh, clay figurines are. In fact, there's over 210,000 of these little clay figurines. And um, he calls them body surrogates. And uh, he actually, I'll show a slide a little later, about uh, he actually had the people who, where he goes to these places, make these. So it's about a collective activity of creation and of then, you know, it's a way of kind of, you're creating this field that then is reflected back at you. And in this case, it's small. It's also to show really the range of the size um, versus, you know, these large scale uh, pieces or um, pieces that are, you know, on top of buildings that you can't touch. So it's actually quite a dynamic practice. It's just something to keep in mind about um, the kind of work uh, that uh, Gormley has done really over his long, long career. Uh, next. Now we're on to 
putting uh, Anthony Gormley's work into context, and you can see it's a, quite a different scenario um, of uh, types of uh, work um, that we have been called public art um, over many years, over many decades, in fact, um, this being one of them, a uh, sort of a long-term installation by uh, a collective, Elmer and Dragset, who are, I think, the co-curators of the next Istanbul Biennial with this, their piece by Prada Marfa. Yeah. Which is also has been commissioned uh, a commissioned project. So also um, um, organization uh, how public art has changed in terms of um, artists initiated to uh, publicly um, generated to um, public organizations that have uh, to permanent to temporary um, organizations that create these uh, scenarios and including you know the one that we have here in Hong Kong. So uh, these are some examples of um, what you might call uh, land art, uh, some famous, famous pieces. And uh, I just thought this one of Christo and Jean-Claude was especially dynamic because, you know, one is an umbrella, just an umbrella. And this is particularly, actually, I thought it was very specific and interesting because it was uh, installed in Japan, uh, partly in Japan and partly in um, in the US and of course the other ones we know uh, or some of you may know, Andres Attel, uh, High Desert Test Sites, uh, Joshua Tree, uh, where she has created this uh, space in the desert for art projects to happen, Robert Smithson's Smile Jetty, Walter Demaria's Lightning Field. And then I also wanted to then bring up um, what I'm calling sort of um, artists who work with urban codes um, for example, the idea of the shop and the street. This is a very, very famous piece by um, American artist David Hammonds where he was selling um, snowballs on the uh, streets of New York. And then also a piece by um, Art Angel, which is a um, commissioner of public art projects in England that uh, worked with uh, Michael Landy to literally, uh, to rent a storefront and he literally um, demolished everything he owned, including a car, to photos of his, you know, parents and his girlfriend and his teddy bear. Everything was completely destroyed. Um, but I thought that was a, an inter a very, very in intriguing project. Next. Next. And then also, uh, I also thought of this, uh, what I'm calling uh, the human quotient or the idea of, you know, uh, Artists who use uh, sort of elements of this, the, this, the street or respond to architecture in quite a different way. Um, Mark Bile, uh, Christoph uh, Wadichko, Michael Rakowitz, Katarina Gross, you know, um, that bring in elements of graffiti, but uh, in fact they're commissioned works, artwork sometime, or uh, with Michael Rakowitz, his Parasite Project, where he's, um, that bridges on design, where he's creating these um, housing for um, homeless um, people on the street to have a place to live, but he, they're also could be considered social sculpture, for example. Um, and Christoph Wodichko's uh, a similar project, uh, homeless vehicle um, from uh, the um, mid, mid 80s, I believe. Again, so it's kind of a historic reference. So there's a, quite a long history of these um, kinds of uh, responses to um, the real body, let's say, uh, the physical body and the way that it engages with uh, the urban environment. And then the last uh, thing I wanted to touch on, which I think that we'll talk about as well a little bit, is uh, things that are always, I think, related to art, but uh, somehow, um, I think, because of the public nature of public art, I mean, even when you go into museums, it's public, but somehow when something is, let's say, dropped in your lap, as opposed to you going into to see a show, for example, um, as such as the case with Anthony Gormley, um, then there's this kind of a, a different uh, feedback sometimes from uh, the community or the public, let's say. Just, uh, just because it's placed there doesn't mean that it will be received in the same way that the artist expects. And these are some uh, famous uh, cases where that has taken place. Uh, this is a famous piece by Richard Serra called Tilted Arc, which some of you may know, um, it was installed in the Federal Plaza in New York from 1981 to 1989, and through much uh, debate, was removed. 
And here are some examples of some other um, some other examples, uh, another Art Angel Commission, uh, one of their first, and I would argue one of still one of their most famous, uh, Rachel White Reed, her house project, where she um, basically created, uh, filled the last uh, home that was being taken down because of gentrification and created this kind of temporary monument. Um, it was eventually taken down, but it becomes this kind of temporary monument to um, the, a community that's really lost. Um, and, and then uh, uh, some of you may know the famous Tribute in Light uh, as an, paid an homage to uh, September 11th, and it's, um, the lights are turned on every September 11th since like 2001. Uh, another famous project by John Ahern, um, which is an artist who would like do these really great um, castings of the community and then um, put them back into um, the Bronx neighborhood where he was really friends with many of uh, the, the participants. So similar to Gormley, for example, very similar uh, approach. Um, but then when he was commissioned to um, sort of do this figure in this skate park, it was met with a very, very hostile response and he chose himself after a few days to remove these sculptures, um, and I think that um, it's the same today with um, figurative sculptures that uh, could potentially seem to presume a sort of uh, sense of a community, and then sometimes the community reacts in a much different way. Um, and then we have uh, Jeremy Deller, the Battle of Orgreave, which was a minor strike that happened, and he basically had real people reenact, uh, just like you have many um, people who reenact military battles, but he reenacted re a very recent um, um, a protest, in, in essence, between um, miners and then their pits or their livelihoods being shut down. Um, and so all of these pieces, to me, are um, whether or not their performance, whether or not their sculpture, um, have a kind of time-based nature to them. And I think they question um, quite firmly the idea of what, um, how you honor something, what monuments tend to do. And, um, and that sort of old-fashioned idea of you know, a bronze figure, sculpture. Um, I, I wouldn't say that to Gormley because he's sort of, I think, different on top of buildings. Like he's sort of taken that to an, another level, quite literally. But in terms of that more um, classic approach that you see the um, cast um, brass figure often in like the middle of a park or something like that. So I think all of these sort of challenge those notions. So, um, and the other thing, oh, sorry, the last slide. Yeah, this is another monument that recently happened called the Gramsci Monument by an artist named Thomas Hirshhorn. He also did a series of these based on different um, theorists. He did one called the Bataille Monument. Um, but what's nice about these, I think, is I actually attended this one. There was a food place to eat for a place for kids to actually um, make, make things. He actually goes into these places and speaks very, um, works with the community to create the, the, the spaces that they might find useful. Um, the library, of course. <laughs> but what I like about these uh, series is that he's taking, uh, taking the idea of um, the written word, the theory around public art, and really trying to test it. You know, um, there was a great story I was reading where he was working with this community in um, Germany and all of his equipment got stolen. Um, and he was like very, he thought, oh, if it doesn't get returned, then, you know, the, the trust had been lost with the, uh, with, the, um, with the community. But then it was like secretly returned, so then the project continued. And so it's like all these like, uh, it's like a real, like a human negotiation, which I thought was kind of a, a nice idea um, with, with this ongoing project or ongoing monument series, project series. And the last thing I'll touch on, uh, which is, uh, which I will talk about more, is I was thinking a lot um, because of the, the range of um, projects, the projects that we've shown, and also even within Anthony Gormley's own practice of a scale of using people's bodies, his own body, um, when does the, sculpture become a human? When does, when does that start to happen? Um, another reason why I was showing artists who do um, um, projects based on uh, uh, 
people that you don't invisible, the invisible body, such as um, the, the homeless, for example. So I just wanted to sort of like, um, and with, so that is the reason why I brought these two slides up, um, just as a sort of a jumping off point to our larger discussion. Um, you may know this famous piece with Red Cube by Asama Noguchi in, um, in New York, uh, another case where um, public art is developed now that it's uh, very popular for um, uh, as buildings go up through projects like the Percent for Art program where a percentage of budgets will go towards the creation of a, a permanent public art piece um, to very, again, very historic famous pieces like Meryl Laderman Euclid's where she uh, was basically t washing the, um, washing the floors of this uh, museum in upstate New York. So in both cases, even though one's about maintaining a sculpture that's already been created, and the other is really um, using those activities as an artwork, I think they both, we don't, I, I guess it they're kind of reminded me that there are real people, not only that are used to create these artworks and, and, and the, the public that sees them and engages them and we are talking about them, but there are real people who clean these, make these, <laughs> um, um, and I just think that it's kind of a, maybe something we can uh, think about as well as we uh, move forward. So with that, I'm gonna pass it on to my uh, fellow speakers. Thank you so much. We well, thank you, Ingrid. She quickly introduces the overall environment of discussion, the contest. Some early works by Anthony Gohomny, how the body interacts with the environment. Secondly, all over the world, various artworks in public spaces and in everyday exhibition halls. How the venue affects the exhibition. There have been a string of works very diversified in different countries and settings. So now we discuss on Hong Kong, the city, how we comprehend and, and how art creates space in Hong Kong. Hi, everybody. When AAA invited me, I was to speak as an artist on public art or on Anthony Gourmet, but, but when I prepared my PowerPoint, I noticed that, oh, it cannot be done. So I collect and compiled, compiled information information that's benefit for the audience here. I want to demonstrate here myself as an artist or as an analyst how, how I make theoretically informed practice in Hong Kong and under concepts of Hong Kong, what it encompasses, such as uh, Hong Kong's local spatial politics, what we often talk about the bureaucracy of the real estate developers, or urban planning, justice within urban planning. Also, Hong Kong as a city, it's, it's historical context and issues deriving from it. So for today's relatively short talk, I'll try to pick up to should be two, two, two educational projects that are um, on public spaces. And they are not exactly projects, but I was expecting arrest by the police. But for today, I really want to talk about my kind of practice, the, the inherent, the deepening of the theory and how the theory becomes something that can be intervened into politics. And intervening into politics, the most significant point is to intervene in politics. So right off the start, we'll jump very far. We'll jump to Beijing because why? So it will be understandable later on. One thing that I want to talk about is the concept of monumentality. This quote is from Wu Hong. He's an art historian, 
on contemporary art. People may know him or her better as a contemporary art creator, but as a scholar, he, someone I quite admired, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a fan. What's interesting is that because earlier was a scholar in um, the bronze and the ancient dynasty, the architecture at those times, but during those antiquated times, back to the modern times, the analysis throughout, that's what he excelled in. So. Talk, talking about what's monumentality, when we talk about monumentality, it's highly related to what Ingrid mentioned just now. If there's a physical object or whether the object with its surrounding environment, surrounding people, is there a specific community, is there a relationship there? It's not just a physical object. It may not be the most important aspect, but the most important is how it activates the surrounding environment for monumentality. What's so special about it is that in certain national narratives, it plays an important role. And here, what I showcase here, if you go to Washington, it's exactly the same. And I'll be talking about Hong Kong for public art when we try to deal with our identity. It couldn't be escaped from our great majestic homeland. It's historical and time and context. So not to go into details here, but if you're interested, you can you can look for the article by Wu Hong. Why I want to talk about Tiananmen Square and Monument to the People's Heroes. Everyone in attendance here, have you been to Beijing? Could you raise your hand? Or? So I don't need to go into details. You kind of have an idea on the monuments, on the locations and whatnot. But what's interesting is that during the analysis, in the space and time there, the, the relationship in space and time, the spacing, the relationship in spacing, it explains the history as well in retrospective in traditional Chinese architecture. Facing north and the bottom towards the south. So it's the orientation like as such for Tiananmen Square in traditional Chinese architecture. You have walls, you have the city walls. In Tiananmen Square, what was interesting was that passing the imperial history from the context of Marxism. These are historical monuments of the past. So what's interesting was that during the establishment of the Republic, they took away some of the outer walls of the Tiananmen Square and established the Tiananmen Square. The hidden imperial space, originally hidden within the city wall, where commoners could never see, and it became a center of power. This order from north to south. So what's interesting, from north to south, this extension, what the Communist Party did, they built a monument to the people's heroes. The past history. They erected a vertical column, a vertical structure. A vertical structure is, is erected there. But at the same time, the architectural form adapts to the Chinese traditional format. When people go to Tiananmen Square, the structure of Mao Zedong and this monument is actually a dialogue of 
Mao Zedong and the monument to the people's heroes because the inscriptions of the people's hero monument is by Mao Zedong himself. So actually the time and space is quite important. Oh, I cannot go into that much of detail. The article is very good, so please check it out. So what's interesting is that an official history wished to portray this narrative as such, but the community, how relationship is formed with the community build up, to build up the meaning, it needs people in flesh, in person, to build up. So, looking back at this, at this monument, what does it look like? What does it resemble? Just from average people's perspective, what does it look like? It's like a tombstone. Does it look like a plaque worshipping the descendants? So such is history. These two slides, 20, more than 20 years passed by between these two photos. The right photo was taken during 1989. The first photo was taken when Zhou Enlai passed away and the people were paying tribute. Ten years of cultural evolution, revolution had elapsed since then. There had been a lot of power struggle. Zhou Enlai had been perceived as a kind of figure within the whole power struggle. And at that time, the official stance was not to have any celebrate any memorial activities for Joe. But people on their own initiatives they put they place flowers there at the monument. So the official discourse and the people's reaction were different. The, the official monument is, is right on its own there, but people place another kind of another kind of um, memorial flowers there. So at that time, it was during the festival when people pay tribute to those people who passed away. So this this memory belonging to the you, you would think that it was suppressed, but actually it's quite resilient. The sensitivity of the people towards this monument well, during 1989, another civil movement, when another figure passed away, relatively more liberal figure passed away, everyone rushed back to the monument again. So uh, if people remember, Initially, there were there was the portrait of Wu Yubang there. The statue, the statue of Mao Zedong was facing this monument. It actually covers the entire base, more or less, of the people's hero monument. More critical is. During the 1989 movement, when it's kind of in the <laughs> in its height, when it's very difficult to handle the whole situation, a newer symbol is required to represent the whole movement, the democratic movement. So what's interesting was that the goddess of democracy. From the perspective of gender, it's interesting. The, the entire square, there are not a lot of feminine figures, but on the contrary, there's a young, slender, presentable female. Actually, there are a lot of details to dwell into this, the analysis of the goddess of democracy. As you can notice, it borrows the concept of the Statue of Liberty from the United States, but it also tries hard to put 
ancient elements and features in the statue. It wants to be revolutionary, but it doesn't really have a revolutionary language. A, a form of heroic figure to represent democracy. But what's critical is that the positioning. If you look at this diagram, it's kind of clear. It's placed directly in front of Mao Zedong's portrait. So it's like presenting the history after 1949. It's been reversed. It plays a period, a period mark to Mao Zedong. Another, aside from these considerations of representation, at the time the students were considering where to place the goddess of democracy, the scale was also very important. Back to the scholar Wu Hong in the research. At the time, one of the consideration was to, in a short time, to build a statue as large as possible. Why? It serves to occupy, like today's terms, how, how to occupy the space, physically occupy the space, so that it would be harder for government to clear the space. There's a horrible curse involved also. When the goddess of democracy is there, then the movement is there. When it's clear, then the students had to be clear. So it became a self-fulfilled prophecy. Oh. <laughs> now we jump back to Hong Kong and uh, situation. This, this tripod, do people remember it? Where is it located? Where is it located right now? Do you know what it is? It's a handover treasure tripod. Do you know where it is now? It's at Lantau Island. Where? Where in Lantau Island? So now this is interesting. A tripod. <laughs> so a tripod. Usually people would only think to of seeing a tripod in the temple, but the tripod itself in Chinese bronze history is also a vessel for worshipping, but it's also a symbol of authority as well. What's interesting is that at the time, the tripod was done by a Hong Kong artist, a significant figure, significant artist, sculptor in Hong Kong. What's interesting was that at the time of promoting modernism in Hong Kong, social realism was thriving in mainland to different ideas, to different movements. But when this tripod, which is supposed to be about Hong Kong, the ethnic identity of Hong Kong, there isn't any. It couldn't be done in the genre of social realism. But it couldn't, it couldn't be done in the style of Henry Moore either. So, with a lack of choices, just present, present Hong Kong's relationship and contest within China in a very antiquated genre. So the most modern elements is, is have to a windmill at the front. That's about it. Actually, there are a lot of stories involved. I couldn't find a photo at that time. When the tripod arrived in Hong Kong, it was the 1st of July. Because a special celebration committee, a committee with a very long name, the tripod was placed at Victoria Park. 
at the time, some friends and I. When they were placing erecting the tripod, we have some candles ready to try to solicit the meaning from the tripod. The people don't know how to respond because we are not there to destroy it or to attack it. We're just there to worship it. So they weren't sure if they have to kick us out. Oh, my time is up. So I have to hurry. What I want to say was that right now at the Bohemia Square in Wan Chai, what we noticed, the other kind of morning is still interesting. I haven't done a full research in Hong Kong, but in Hong Kong, we could not establish monumentality. It's not because of aesthetic reasons, it's because of our identity. We're still unsure, we still couldn't discern our identity. Whether we have a relationship with the country, whether we don't. So we couldn't really do monuments. Looking back at Hong Kong sculptures, I think that the more ex more successful example of a monument is the flying Frenchman. About his style, its motif, many people have discussed already. I will not dwell on this topic, but another intervention. When we within the city, in the existing space, the existing structures, when we couldn't even tell our stories there, what could we do? So, at the time I thought, we'll hijack it, we'll discover, we'll rediscover the more realistic aspect as different from the what the government tells. So, the flying Frenchman, according to folklore hearsay, it's not a Frenchman. Why, why would one place a, a Frenchman in Hong Kong? It doesn't make sense. It's like placing a British person in Hong Kong. It doesn't make sense. So, when you look back at the cultural center, the establishment of the cultural center, that was a, the time when Hong Kong is going to return to the mainland China. It was after 19, not too soon after 1989, and people were afraid of reunification. It seems like French people like to present these gifts, so there are reasonable doubt that this is not a, an actual Frenchman. And actually, he's a freedom fighter instead. So, what we did then, we paid tribute by placing flowers there. A number of artists, including myself, we dedicate the flowers to the Freedom Fighter statue. So we start this event of dedicating flowers. It's relatively small scale initially, but eventually it turned into the 21st anniversary of the event. So Woofer Tan publicized the event and dedicated the flowers again. It became highly, it became a big scale event. It's like a reopening. So through these actions, we are not fighting for this physical object, but through our action to interpret it, to interpret the monument. So jumping ahead, the public space in Hong Kong, the public art in Hong Kong within public space, what I felt was that within Hong Kong public space, there are two major paradigms. There are a lot of um, contradictions between the two paradigms. When you walk towards City Hall, there, the works are somewhat 
from the 1970s. You know, City Hall was built in 1962. It was under British colonial. It was an important project of localization under the colonial period. So what's been presented to Hong Kong as gift, there had been no Hong Kong identity then. A public space was produced within the public space. There was some significance of political power within. It was placed kind of at the end of the line. It wasn't very apparent. It was presented purely as an administrator. The photo on the left was the 20th anniversary website of City Hall, talking about what the art object was about. It recounted the sculpture by Henry Moore. People could enjoy it at the space, but people, let's not forget. There's the scenery of the bridegroom holding up the bride. Because the guard, what's so important about the garden was this peaceful environment, contemplative space, people are, are, are joyful where they celebrate the getting married. Because when you get married, get to you need to register. It's it concerns your tax, concerns your housing distribution, educational planning, urban planning. All these are highly related to the colonial period and how its power enter us, enter our sphere, enter our private sphere. Okay, jumping back. And this is interesting. It seemed like very open-minded, very open. It's free of charge. People who used to live or work in Central will talk about, will recount their memories of having the lunch box and eating right over there, right at the sun. But at the same time, it has its, its hidden evil, or I should say hidden political power within this public sphere. And other important paradigm in Hong Kong is the public space. Sorry. Privatized public space. Simply speaking, it is within urban planning in Hong Kong. Originally, something good intentionally, but which benefited the private owner because by providing public space, people can build taller buildings. But the property owner actually have double benefits, such as erecting a public sculpture, but in fact, there are a lot of security guarding it, what you can or cannot do near it. But there have been a shift in the middle. Public sculptures in the past, if you look at the sculptures in Exchange Square, you, you could not approach near. It's, it's somehow perched above something. We didn't have a creativity discourse then. It's kind of above you. If you look at the sculpture in Shatin, it looks it looks very friendly and democratic, but but the space is actually privatized already. It seems like you win a bit, but actually you lose a lot. Teachers may recall. Classmates may make, make fun of it or take over the space. Another going to details. You can check the websites listed. Aside from the physical space mentioned just now, time is also very important. Especially this privatized public space. 
it prompts consumption, prompts flow of capital. So, and, and the way is, if you do things very slowly there, then you're already blocking the rhythm of it. Another intervention we did was um, at the public space, you just walk in a straight line very, very slowly. Walk in the straight line in the course of an hour. So, finally, jumping out of these PowerPoints here, which could be further complemented by uh, what the other speakers spoke on the event horizon, this project, its relationship with the surrounding environment is interesting. The public, when it includes people, it also excludes yet others. The location it is placed at, what's the significance? I hope that people will continue to consider on this question. called The Urban Revolution. So in recent years, um, a group of people called Urban Theorists took this book. And they claim that since 1970, we have entered a new, uh, a new period. And the term is planetary organization. So one of the proof is that over 50% of the whole population on Earth are living in a city now. So planetary means uh, global. So wherever you live uh, in, on this planet, your life experiences are influenced by urban experiences. Whether you are actually in, in the 
我哋會唔會話播緊一個叫 urban life 啦，或者或者誒、呃、抽象啲嚟講，即係我哋每一個都係一個 urban mode of being， 即係或者一個誒城市嘅存在。咁但係咧，雖然我話俾大家可以話係，或者地球上每人都 share 一個城市生活，但係我哋有好唔同嘅城市經驗嘅。咁但係咧，我頭先第一張嗰個，哈，嗰啲片嘅時候咧，我覺得我開心咧，就好睇就能夠。So whether you can live a good life actually depends on whether you can take control of your urban experiences by making sense of them, and also actually act actively shaping the environment. So it actually sounds simple. And one example is like whether you have a good domestic life depends on good control of your house. So if you have a good domestic environment, you will have a good life. So urban art is actually considered as a means of taking control of the urban environment to change your urban experiences. So I would claim that urban art is not necessarily our place in the city or necessarily street style art or street art. So there are actually lots of kind of art that point to certain group living in the city, say uh, urban music, like people, uh, music made by black people, but I wouldn't agree with those arguments. So there are certain direct ways to change our urban experiences, and one example is an organization based in Sam Shui Po called HK Walls. So they've done very huge scale graffitis on certain buildings in Sam Shui Po. Recent years, people also talk about the meaning of graffiti or the art on city on building facades. So there's also another artist who's uh, a friend of Banksy. So they invited all their friends to come together and uh, come together, use grey paint to cover all the work that he's done before. Some claim that graffiti actually hindered the holistic development of urban space. Another argument is that by placing artworks in the city, you actually change the whole experience. So when we look at urban art, we actually look at the interaction between the artwork and the development of the, of the city itself. We were talking about the uh, people who are able to change the environment to improve their urban experience. And one of those people is our architects. So one of the most famous example is uh, the case in a famous city in Spain called Bilbao. And by placing one building there, the whole city, the destiny of the whole city was, was changed. So the architect is called Frank Gehry, who is an internationally renowned architect. And the case is now called the Bilbao effect, so the whole city has changed now. Originally, it was a post-industrial city uh, on the downturn, but the museum itself changed the, the whole city. There are some other architects who actually changed the history of the whole, the whole city, and one of them is, is called Azaha Hadid, and actually she has a building in Hong Kong too. So we are 
all we are all aware that uh, in Hong Kong there are a lot of traffic jams. So if you're ever stuck in there, you can actually take a closer look at her building and it will be more fun. And another project is by Chanel, a fashion brand in Central. So the project is by placing artworks in the middle of the city for people to look at. So the main point of looking at urban art is whether it can change the interaction between people and the city. And another group of people who have huge control over our urban experiences are advertisement people. So, for instance, in Japan, there are, there are a lot of these um, advertisement designers. So one project is erasing all the uh, ads. So in some places, the government also take active initiative to change our urban experience. For instance, in the UK, there's a project called Art Everywhere, and they put uh, mainly British art uh, throughout the cities in the UK. So I would like to invite you all to think with me about the power structure that determines the urban environment. Who actually decides how our city looks like and who actually influences our urban experiences? Nowadays, people uh, tend to believe that. Uh, whoever leaves a trace on the city who are more influential. So if you leave a little bit trace on the city, you actually change how the city is used. I think it's not very difficult to actually change our urban experience by placing an object in the city. So I have a friend called Him Lo, who just made this artwork this year in Causeway Bay. So on the street, you can probably recognize it. So it was soon caught on Apple and became very fam famous. So my point is to change people's experience in the city is not that hard. It doesn't have to be very, very powerful, privileged people. Another case is a London-based artist called Sarah Gaze. So this district is in South London, which is being gentrified now. So uh, he, she's a sound artist in a literal way, so she plays with sand. The point is that in British culture, uh, only poor people eat broccoli. I know in Hong Kong it's not the case. So, uh, if, uh, if you pass through a construction site, you can actually see a sculpture. This is another instance called Oliver Eliasson, who um, brought this artwork to Paris during the climate conference, a climate summit. So the artwork resembles a, a, a watch. 
so the message is whether you are those in power or used or just using the space you are just playing you're still making use of the urban space so there's often a dichotomy between urban space shapers which are government uh, and urban space users which are the citizens but I don't agree with this dichotomy. People who shape the space can also be uh, users of urban space. For instance, in San Francisco, there was a part, uh, there was a space called Parkland. So it wasn't initiated by the government or by very grassroots organizations. So parklets are basically benches for people to sit on on the street. So the artists went to the shopkeepers and negotiated with them and made sure that the, the space doesn't uh, interfere with the traffic or with the, the, their business. So I believe our work, uh, urban art doesn't have to directly interfere with the urban space. But there are also other kind of urban art that doesn't ch literally change the physical space. One example is about uh, walking. Oh, so two people actually take control of others' mo uh, mobile phones and they SM SMS each other and tell each other how to walk. Say, for instance, do you, are you with me? For instance, one turns left and walks five steps. So the city hasn't changed, but the way people use it has changed. And there's another novelist which I really like. I forgot uh, the nationality. And his name is China Mayville. And the novel is called The City in the City. So they imagine that there's an extra layer above the actual city. And how can we make and imagine how can we make use of that layer? So after 1970s, especially in Paris, especially after the 76 May Paris student movement, people started, especially artists, began to think deeply and actively about art as urban intervention and to take control of the, the urban space. One of the most important cases is uh, Gordon Clark, who passed away very early in his life. So this artwork is about cutting through the buildings to, uh, to, uh, to be uh, deconstructed. So you may have to pass through those buildings very often, even if you didn't take a close look at the cabinet. So a lot of Gordon's work is about objects to be destroyed. So in 1970s New York, uh, there was an economic crisis and no one really liked Martha Rosser, who worked in collaboration with Dia Art Foundation. And they worked on a series that differs from the previous two cases 
they didn't change the city physically or reimagine how to engage with the city. So actually, their approach is, is to rethink how the city is being generated. So they had a discussion with a lot of social workers, and, and they discussed the function of social art was to reveal the urban practices and also the processes of city making. If you're interested, please take a look at this book, which is very easy to find in Hong Kong. So in Hong Kong, we actually have similar practices. One is called Uferten in Yamate. And one thing they are very concerned with is uh, how homeless people live in the district of Yamate. So the space was actually occupied by homeless people. So actually they use this space to respond to social uh, phenomenon in the same district. So I talked about several different approaches of urban art. One is to change the urban space physically and one is to reimagine different ways of using the city. And the third one is if you pay attention, you can actually find another city. It's not just about different ways of using the city. It's actually about exploring a whole different city. This might sound hard to understand or abstract, but if you take a look at this book called Explore Everything, uh, which takes a look at the interstitial and residual landscapes in our usual surroundings, you will find some overlooked spaces. So a lot of people are actually uh, taking or paying close attention or revealing those overlooked or non-mainstream alternative spaces in the means of art. And I recommend this uh, documentary and also the book called To Reach the Clouds. So, it's a series of documentaries. So, the main story is about a madman. So, uh, he put a wire in between two buildings and wanted to walk on it. So if we put it in the framework of urban art, he actually belongs to a third category. So it's not about the physical or positive space in the city, it's about a negative space that makes you discover a whole new space. It's a good example of the third approach. Uh, another example I really appreciate is an event by Make a Difference, which is a whole series of events under uh, on Hill Road. Do you know where it is? It's in Taiwan, Canada Town. So on Hill Road, there is a flyover which is one of the most interesting flyovers in the world. It's very steep, and also the distance between the flyover and the ground is actually great. It's, it's, it's very big. So I always thought about making a, a, ver a very steep theater there. It will become the most beautiful theater in Hong Kong. And another term I would like to introduce is called tactical urbanism. And this book, uh, this term is a little bit pessimistic. 
the assumption is that if you can't change the majority of the city, so why not try something in between? Why don't we dig out something that's more interesting to us? And one of the early artists that used this approach uh, is a group called Rebar Art and Design, and they're they had an event called Parking Day, which is now more common in other cities. So it's about occupying parking lots when it's not being used, say, during the night. So imagine making use of a parking lot. So I've already overrun, so I'm coming to an end. So another instance is from a, 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 a school from UCL, a school in London. And I really like this book uh, called The Unknown City. So it's also about exploring a city that you didn't know before. I'll skip this. So before I talked about a triangle, so three perspectives of looking at urban art. One is to change the physical environment, even leaving a small trace. So you've seen um, knitted or work all around our city. And the second approach is to change people's imagi imagination. For instance, uh, there's one Hong Kong organization called The Law Map. And it's an interactive website where you can uh, mark which uh, green spaces can be used. And the third is to discover a new space. So today, I want to introduce the triangular framework for looking at urban art. So today, going back to Anthony Gormley, he is an example of the first approach, which is to placing an object in the art. So I wanted to look at Anthony's uh, work within this framework, comparing their uh, pros and cons. So I also wanted to argue that not only government architects or developers as uh, architectural professional or urban professional, I think everyone can be an urban professional. And we all have the right to shape the urban space we're living in. So, so Shanghai Expo just had the slogan called Better City, Better Life. So I would like to ask the question, how do you sh actually shape the city? And I think Shanghai actually <laughs> wanted to <laughs> So now I will try to summarize my thoughts in five minutes because there's not much time left. Uh, we don't have much time until seven. So I would like to put everything we covered back to context of Anthony's project. So this is one of my favorite perspectives, which is Anthony's uh, sculpture on the wall. And he has this quote, we exist in space. Which is to encourage people to look at city spaces. So actually, does this actually bring a new perspective to us? I think so. When the sculpture is not there, we don't see much on our skyline. And also, in this project, a very special thing is that, is that a lot of imaginations around the body. 
咁誒，佢話當我做緊呢個 project 嘅時候，當我睇緊呢個啊，佢自己嘅身體嘅 sculpture， 擺上去嘅時候，佢就覺得啊，有好多嘢嘅時候，佢就覺得啊，有好多嘢嘅時候，佢就覺得啊，有好多嘢嘅時候，佢就覺得啊，有好多嘢嘅時候，佢就覺得啊，有好多嘢嘅時候，佢就覺得啊，有好多嘢嘅時候， Look at the sculptures, and I thought to myself, "Oh, does it actually keep me there and looking?" Because there was a kind of tour. I was actually quite influenced by the tour guide. So one of the questions raised by the tour guide is that how can you actually place the sculpture on the ground and make sure that it's it's intact? So there are around 30 of them in the city. So there are also questions. Um, if it's not a British body, what other body could it be? And also, what about the social responses? So it's not that we never put our works on the rooftop. Why is there so much controversy now? For instance, there is this bus on Peninsula Hotel, and it actually works. So people get very nervous and worried. But then, actually, the psychology between these two, uh, two cases are very different. Is it because one is a bus and the other is a human body? So as a Hong Konger, I would actually think, wow, this takes a lot of money. So why don't we turn into a hundred lunch boxes and give them to homeless? Would that be much better? And, but if you look at it at night, you actually uh, get some insight from the art support. The way figures are black figures. So, yeah, it actually makes sense. You seldom look at the rooftop at night. So actually the team and also the artists notice that a lot of the rooftops are named after um, big corporations like a certain bank or a company. But when a human body is actually placed there, does it make the building feel more friendly and less commercialized? And also this sculpture is juxtaposed with modern inventions. So if it's okay to place human body with modern inventions, would it be okay to replace it with other things? Another question is, how does the public respond to those public art sculptures? So I've seen several sculptures on the ground level and observe people's reactions. People love to touch them. Some people have very special reactions that are quite interesting. So Samson was talking about changing our experience. And would this kind of action qualify as one of those actions? But after three minutes, does it actually change anything? And in central, it looks interesting, but seems like no one actually pays attention to them. But then if you look at the official uh, uh, website, you see people are either deeply engaged with the sculpture or they look very confused. But actually, as an onlooker, I, I have doubts about those reactions. I didn't feel much. So in this kind of situation, uh, the street is right next to Lan Kui Fong. But the sculpture didn't attract me. What attracts me is this 
一對情侶咧喺。一個一分鐘嘅行人，然後入燈嘅時間咧，係出嚟拍婚紗照。佢哋係喺公園度等，然之後知道佢入燈嘅時間即刻跑出嚟。And they waited for a long time for the green light to turn on, and they rushed to the middle of the street during this one minute green light. So while they were kissing, they actually attracted lots of attention. So I think this dramatically changed this our bank experience. So while Anthony Gormley's work is being very inquired, I think other people are taking more active interventions. They at least ran 20 times to get this done. They were just pursuing. Observation. I will see that you see that you are in the middle of the street. You will invite other people to respond to you. This response is okay. Very good. This response is very good. It seems like you have a very close feeling. But this response is because some people are calling you to the phone and call you to the street. And then, 佢哋住為咗要令到佢唔係坐街，所以佢就擺咗三個大嘅座位。話俾你聽，呢度唔係一個坐街嘅方。後來佢呢個男仔有啲走咗。香港嘅經驗原來係咁嘅。OK， 咁跟住當然啦，我哋都知道呢個可以好快咁經過啦，會有多唔同人嘅諗法。誒訪問咗一啲誒公眾人士，公眾人士會話：，誒、哎、其實呢啲嘢係藝術嘅，唔係咁樣搞藝術嘅，其實應該要有啲導賞。誒有唔同人都會講藝術嘅。哎香港人藝術嘅嘢，你又識咩咧？係咯，但係其實唔係啊嘛。藝術如果如果本身有 intention， 佢本身嘅藝術家有一個諗法，佢想帶俾個城市，佢想同你哋一齊互動嘅時候，可以。有一個亦都好可愛嘅，放咗喺黃象廣場。大家都知道黃象廣場冇黃象㗎啦。黃象廣場揾到黃象啦，得翻呢個人，呢、這個人係邊個嚟嘅咧？呢、这個人唔係，呢、这個人係邊個嚟嘅？呢、这個人係同匯豐銀行有關嘅。佢係曾經匯豐銀行嘅一年嘅 banker， 佢有好大嘅，好勁啊！咁然之後記念咗喺度。有一啲原因，歷史因素 relocate 咗黃浩俊。黃浩俊而家喺維多利亞公園。咁啊，聽日我再講多啲。咁但係咧，好笑啊！三十一個喺香港嘅 Andy Gomi 嘅 subject 咧，唯一一個背後係有個導賞嘅牌。因為呢個係一個公園，呢個係康文署嘅地方。然之後咧，康文署咧就話收到好多家長話，小朋友嚟呢一度嘅。然之後咧，見到有個性器官，希望大家有一個適當嘅指導。所以咧，就擺咗個牌喺度，話俾你聽，呢個係 artwork。但係其實唔需要話俾你聽，呢個 artwork 你都知道嗰個性器官其實係一個真嘅性器官。咁但係呢個引起我哋新嘅聯想。呢、这個好快都會講，其實攞到世界觀，曾經是個好勁嘅事嚟嘅喎。一九九五年啊，一個隔離嗰棟大廈，後邊嗰棟大廈，賣借咗誒一個 sculpture， 但係好可惜佢嘅性器官係有啲反面。咁然後俾人告，俾人告完之後咧，人住咧係做咗一個擺一擺，擺一擺，擺一擺，擺一擺，擺一擺，擺一擺，擺一擺，擺一擺，擺一擺，擺一擺，擺一擺。There was a court ruling against the public display. So the art center actually placed something in front of it to cover it. But then later the court also ruled that discussion around this case should be banned. So, there is that there's very little discussions about aesthetics around this project. Do we intentionally avoid those discussions or we were on the whole of talking about aesthetics? And this is the best modification I've ever seen, so I guess this is shot by a drunk man. So I think this looks like an ancient uh, ghost. But can these form of interaction be recorded and kept? So one of the big questions I have is who has the right 
make use of it and what's this project's relationship to Hong Kong, especially to its public space? I think the answer is yes and no. One of the engagement is that it's in, it's in Central, where people work very hard and people often feel stressed. So my question is how I engage with people's urban spaces. I think you come to this talk for various reasons. Maybe you really like this project or you have doubts or maybe you even hate this project. I think it's a very good concern. It's a very interesting concern because we are not here to make statements. We are here to discuss. We are not making judgments of right or wrong, good or bad. So here we have different artists and we have urban theorists talking about urban art in Hong Kong and abroad. So do we actually need international artists to help us and reshape our urban environment. So we don't have much time left. We welcome you to join us in the discussion. So if you have any feedback or question, please raise your hand. We can talk about it. Yes, please. So I've made an artwork on some stairs before placing some stickers on the stairs. It's very safe, but then we were still stopped by police. But then why are these sculptures being allowed to be displayed on sculptures in, uh, on buildings in Central? So who actually decides what <laughs> public art can take place? Uh, I can't represent the, the official organizers. But I can, I can talk about some responses on the internet. So I know that the organizer found a lot of developers and also government officials to help them. And they even found Carrie Lam. So a lot of government departments actually helped coordinate this. I, again, I can't I can't say um, how it was done here, but um, just having um, some experience elsewhere. Um, that's what I was mentioning earlier about organizations that are specifically uh, commissioned public art. Um, there's uh, sometimes in places there are government organizations that work with the city when it's permanent sculpture, and that um, having served on a few juries where of selected permanent commissions. Um, you're talking, um, usually it's a blind jury, so it's really meant to be um, many, many different people have a, sorry, very, um, a, a, a different, um, sort of a jury that can appear, so it seems very open that, that what gets selected, um, and then you're talking to like um, people from the city, from like lighting technicians, sometimes there's like permits involved. It's actually a quite an intense process. Um, but I think there's a difference between uh, works that are commissioned in a uh, uh, temporary period of time, of which Anthony Gormley is one, um, to uh, permanent commissions. And then I would add to that maybe a little bit what Samson was saying um, and what we were talking about in general about when they're um, associated with um, uh, property, in essence. So some things that you don't even imagine are um, have a very direct relationship. Uh, to um, property that gets built and what gets built and um, and and sometimes uh, that has a very direct relationship to um, art that's in essence um, a, it's great that people can see it but uh, sometimes there is a direct relationship to uh, what buildings get built and <laughs> and things like that so um, that's all part of it I thought of the space, that's very interesting. <coughs> so 
so if I take a scarf with me and raise it, can I say that I'm using this space, I'm retrieving this space? So if I buy some things and if I post and leave some objects on the space, so a lot of questions come to my mind. So what about the homeless people? Uh, they are they're using cardboards to occupy space. You can say it's fr environmentally friendly, or you can say they're actually practicing some art. How do we look at these kind of practices? What about these alternative practices? So I come from an art background. So I look at it from different perspectives. Why are these people taken to prison? What about uh, some other viewpoints? I have a question about the power or the public So I think in Hong Kong, in order to make such public scale, a huge scale public art project, it takes a lot of money. So it's very hard for an individual artist to do this. It has to be at a commission. So how much of the project comes from the artist's own ideas or whether it's more the commission or tell the artist what to do? So there was one instance of an object on the rooftop, is it also called an artwork? We are always questioning how Hong Kong can have public art of its own character. I'm talking about artists who have their own original ideas. So we've seen a lot of events that are maybe not permanent, but then these happenings are actually initiated by artists themselves, and they are taking place in public space. But a lot of them are not in real public spaces. I have a response to this question. So I've taken pictures of sculptures in shopping malls and I was stopped. And they said, oh, in order to take pictures, you have to talk to the owners of the shopping mall. And I was really mad. So there was a period when a lot of Thailand tourists came to Hong Kong and I took my students there again to take pictures and that time it was no problem. So we think in this situation no one cares about local people taking pictures. So I was thinking about how actually the community can change the way people use the space. So, I was thinking this tourist is a huge group of people and they can actually do whatever they want. So sometimes we take pictures of them and it becomes a work of art. I think this kind of use of urban space is very interesting. 
I have a question too. So as the body, I feel we might understand the meaning of the art very well. But then in public space, it does um, have the tendency of creating some imaginations or some or like making people think of jumping off the building. So how do we perceive the function or the use of art in a society? Of course, some consequences are unexpected. As teachers and as educators, we have to cope in a different way, but as our practitioners, how do we look at this problem? About a workplace in Causeway Bay by him, I don't know whether the author himself thinks of the piece as an artwork or think of, think of it as a political slogan. Yeah, is it piece of art or maybe the author doesn't think of it as art but then other audiences think of it as art. Another case is that during umbrella movement, people actually can see many large-scale objects or artistic creations on site. So, same question, do we see them as artworks or do we see them as more a political message? So where does the boundary lie? Is the boundary very clear or very vague? How do we um, find principles of doing this? For a place, we talk about this. When something is placed in the, a public space, it instantly becomes politicized. We can never avoid that. So whether you place something in a certain place also involves other people's opinions. Like the instruction text I mentioned next to Conley's uh, sculpture. I think it shouldn't be there, but then actually some parents complained about it and then the relevant government department talked about it and their role was to deal with complaints, so they had to put it there. So of course, the art artist might have different intentions of putting an artwork in the public space, but then other people's involvement will change the thing. So for instance, the traffic cone on top of and today's globally, it's, a, it's unexpected and something else. I'm trying to summarize my thoughts on these thoughts that the audience raised. One of the questions is called consumer democracy. democracy. And, and they are very relevant to the art we're talking about today. It's very debatable whether this kind of public art is right or wrong. The bigger question is whether th such terms are liberating. So let's go back to the case of Anthony Gormley. So I believe mm, not a lot of you have joined the public tour we just held. So some audience are... There are some doubts around this tour. One claim is that this is the biggest public art project in Hong Kong history ever. My question is, why do we call this the biggest in scale? What about Occupy Movement? Is, is it not 
There are a lot of stages and also mobilization of democratic power and also rethinking our communities and holding events related to the communities. Why don't we call this a public art piece? So now let's go back to the location of the piece. Why central? Central is a power center. So none of the us actually has the meaning of choosing central as the location. So I think it's related to the the very sweet and beautiful public art that the colonial government placed in Hong Kong. So how interesting was it to use letters to represent colonial power? So I think this, the relationship between this artwork and Hong Kong as a city, is Hong Kong status as a global city. So if I pass the local element and it plays Hong Kong together with New York, London, and Tokyo, so they might assume that the public don't know much about public art and the public education. So the buildings occupied um, by the artworks are all the most powerful developers. Why do I always emphasize the danger of thinking of every everyday act as <coughs> Our practice because it take, makes use of aesthetics and symbolic economy and there's a huge divide between things people agree with and people disagree with there's one personal example I asked my mom to meet on Times Square in Causeway Bay, and my mom called me and asked, where are you? But she wasn't able to describe where she is. So the, the problem is, as a 70-year-old lady, she wasn't able to read the sign. The, a lot of English signs look very alien to her. So it bypassed her experience of living in the city for a whole lifetime. She couldn't recognize it. She didn't, couldn't recognize the orientation. She, she doesn't know where the tram street is. She doesn't know where the south and north is. So that's the kind of danger, the crisis I'm talking about. And another point is by teaming is the relationship between people working in central and the sculptures. So today, when the colonial framework doesn't work anymore, they talk about global city. So we are not a collective anymore. We are individualized. So it's actually maximizing the units that capitalist system can make use for. Can make use from. And I think it's terrifying. To, it's, it's actually about how helpless people working in Central are. They are so alienated. 
。咁而嗰個嗰個焦慮就係要諗，即係當你成日嗰種聽得多快。And、the anxiety led to suicide, such as jumping from the buildings. And it's not only working people; it's, it's also the students and the teachers. I don't see the a real concern、uh, of Hong Kong's current situation. I think it's very worth debating. <laughs> We just started the discussion, but I have another commitment, and I now have to handle the mic to Samson as a moderator. So I know Samson and the Ingrid still have other views. Sorry. I just wanted to make one、um, small comment.、Um, I understand definitely how、uh, art is what we call instrumentalized for um, um, various reasons.、Um, I can tell you many, many examples of how that's done in other places.、Um, I guess the one thing, though, that I will say is that we're missing,、um, and I won't speak for him, but、um, besides his artwork, Anthony Gormley's、um, voice. And I would hope,、um, in this、um, participation in this project, that he understands the power of、um, his voice as an artist. And、uh, I would like to think, but again, I won't speak for him, that he understands that、uh, he's not. We would hope he's not being instrumentalized. That he's not participating in this, you know, this proposed scenario. Of、um, of contributing to whatever、um, kind of、um, overlying power structures or whatever sort of arguments we've laid out here, so I just wanted to sort of um, um, make us conscious again that the artist's、uh, voice is the reason that we're here, and、uh, that we can't forget、um, that in this discussion,、um, in terms of what their intention and what their hopes are for、uh, projects like this and、um, in an,、uh, in everything that they do. 咁我誒暫時做呢個主持啦。咁想知在座仲多唔多朋友想發言㗎？有冇朋友想發言？好，咁啊 ，I just want to comment on 啊啊 ，Miss Chu's 啊 ，just comment。Um, you keep saying that it's um it's Um, the artist intention and everything, but I think, like in in contemporary arts,、um, the artist maybe he has some kind of other intentional agenda or thoughts or philosophy or whatever. Once he just leaves the artwork, it's actually for us to interpret in our way. So I'm sure he has very very positive, you know, meanings behind it, but. The way we see it,、uh, or just the layman's in Hong Kong, it just doesn't strike as a very, very, how should I say,、um, uplifting things for us. It has so many, so many things that, that as Hong Kongers, just、uh, so frustrated every day. You know, like going to a central to work,、uh, like what,、um, uh, yeah, Leung Bo said. It's actually just like a big, you know, I don't know, just like a bit. How should I say it? It's like、um, just kind of like very, very depressing for us to see because, like you said, like this kind of thing takes a lot of monies, and why should that artist be selected? There are so many good Hong Kong artists as well. Like if you think about like body arts, like there is Hosiu Gay. Why shouldn't he? That's that's. Actually, that was my first thought, and my husband, who's not even in the art field, he's like, "So, why are you why are you guys even talking about it? Just the, just the layman, nobody just really cares about it. Just like if you have money, just put it. Then no, that that's about it. So I think、uh, what I want to say is like the artist's intention 
is not that important here, I think. Well, I, I disagree. I think that it's always important, but absolutely, I was just absolutely, um, well, she's also, um, showing the examples that I did, you know, not art, all artists are going to raise um, the very reason sometimes that they're in the public is, or in, in very many cases, is that they're raising issues that aren't very popular or happy or uplifting, you know, that's in some ways why they make work and uh, create uh, topics uh, for discussion, uh, which is why we're here, for example. Um, and I can tell you that the, the issues you raised about who picks what, who gets selected, I'm not even saying that I'm the you know number one fan of you know uh, this artist or any any example artist, but, uh, any other artist. But I'm just saying that you know that that that's just a part of the discussion that has to be addressed, and um, that in terms of locals not getting selected, local artists versus international, that happens absolutely everywhere in terms of um, when large scale projects happen, when solo museum exhibitions happen, you know, between gender, between race, between, um, you know, it's just, uh, it's pervasive, so. Um, I'd just like to say that I I don't know if you know, but the British Council has also offered um, a teacher's pack um, with training materials. And I've, to develop these, I've actually had quite a lot of contact with Anthony Gormley's studio. Um, I would send questions and then a day or two later, the answers would come back. And as far as I'm aware, I'm 95% aware, sure, this did not cost the Hong Kong taxpayer anything at all. Um, it's companies that have sponsored um, and the British Council. And the reason it was chosen, I think the British Council pushed for it. It's traveled, uh, it started in London, went to um, New York, San Paulo. It's a fantastic installation. I agree it's not a Hong Kong artist, I wish it were. Um, but it's starting to pave the way for similar things to happen and let's hope you know, the government's made that possible. Um, the aim of the artist, as far as I'm aware, is to get people talking about the issue, and it's certainly doing that tonight, isn't it? Fantastic. Um, you mentioned sexuality. Anthony Gormley has always said the statue is not a sexual being. It is not an erect penis, and if Hong Kong people have a problem with that, it's a problem, because I believe our kids should learn about these things um, and not sort of keep these things hidden. I, when I produced the materials, had a huge problem with the photographs I included. I had to do it from the waist upwards, not how Anthony Gormley wanted it to be. Um, and also suicide. That was a major problem. I was very concerned for the teachers I was training. I know it's a problem here in Hong Kong. Um, I can't say there have been no suicides as a result, but who knows what you know causes kids especially to commit suicide. It's something I hate. It started a debate. I hope it continues. Um, for all teachers, please remember to check out your EDB website. There's a lot of help for teachers to recognize symptoms in their students and to give support. We don't want more kids committing suicide. Thank you. I might as well give some response to one response is in response to uh, teacher Yuan's views. I think it would be very interesting to uh, have the British Council um, make a publication or a documentary about how the project was realized from its initial thoughts to its realization. I think it takes many efforts to put together such a project. Because I think it actually exposed the power structure within the city and the hidden rules.
So in a way, I'm quite surprised that British Council actually succeeded. I thought it would actually fail because it's too, way too complicated. Sir, I know the project was actually withdrawn in its first phase because of Ben Hur committed suicide jumping off the building. So, although we know that it actually takes a lot of efforts and negotiation with with power holders to realize this project, we can actually it can actually reveal the power structure. So the second response is a question. So if Anthony Scormley is to challenge or thinking about urban space, how successful is he? So if he actually succeeds to shock you or surprise you? So this reminds me of a book called Unexpected Art and it claims that if you see art when unexpected it actually achieves a certain meaning. So I think in this respect the project is not that ambitious or surprising. So another point uh, I wanted to know is Anthony claimed that he wanted to us to look up and observe the city from a different angle. So this is a, a quote from Anthony Gormley. So if we think of the artist's own intention and to measure the impact that way, my question would be, so in, to what extent does it actually bring new experiences to us since we're actually very used to looking up at the skyscrapers. We actually do it every day. I would actually think of it from a different perspective to rethink how much of the space is actually blocked up or blocked by buildings. So a lot of those photos cannot be taken on a ground, a ground level. You have to be at a certain height to take these pictures. So one example is when I was looking at a sculpture from APA in Wan Chai. So I thought, oh, I will actually never look at this building from this perspective. I want to take a picture that's different from others' pictures. So I think it would be more interesting to talk about this issue. A lot of there are a lot of rooftops in Hong Kong, but then how many of them can be accessed and utilized? But another a positive point that I want to raise is a lot when a lot of people take pictures of the project and put them on Facebook or Instagram. It actually enables people to take pictures they never took before of urban landscape. For instance, this picture captures the most beautiful elements or angles of Hong Kong's urban landscape.
that's also overlooked. So as a very as a person who's very conscious of our urban environment, I take lots of pictures all the time. But actually through observing this project and taking pictures of it, I actually noticed a lot of elements I never noticed before. So my point is oh, and another thought. So what we treasure is the kind is the shock we receive when we suddenly see something. Timing raised the point that actually something else would do the same trick too. So I think this kinds of projects, including the rubber duck, is a kind of fran fr franchised way of surprising the citizens. They think you can put something, you can move something from one city to another city and achieve the similar effect. I think it has both negative and positive effects. So one example is one controversial project can come to Hong Kong and become less controversy. I find that very interesting. So add one thing to that because um, maybe because I work at an archive and in researching the materials for this. Um, what you said, Samson, too, with Instagram and social media is the, especially in looking at the section on uh, the history of controversial um, public art projects, of which I've seen none because some of these existed so long ago, it made me think uh, about the lifespan of, of um, public art beyond the time in which they actually exist. And sometimes their legacy or their resonance or their importance over time um, happens over time. And so that's something that I think you, know, you brought up a little bit through the instant moment of uh, social media, but um, in our role as, um, as an archive, and we're documenting this talk right now that we will, you know, you, I'm sure we can, we'll share with people that there's, um, there's uh, other ways that um, maybe not be visible now that um, can have uh, maybe a larger impact or resonance um, about uh, this project and um, public art in general. So we've actually overrun a lot, and let's thank all the speakers today. Let's also thank Samson and also Ting Mei, who's already left. So we AA is an educational partner of British Council, and we would like to provide different perspectives to look at this, these similar project arts. So if there are other kinds of uh, public projects, we hope you can also make use of these perspectives. So actually we have a workshop for teachers tomorrow morning and it's not full yet. So if you are interested, please come to us to sign up. And thank you for coming and participating today. We also thank uh, Alice from British Council and also Joey.